Hey, good evening, everybody. I know y'all coming in. <clears throat> good evening, good evening, good evening. Hmm? Be sure to like, share, and comment tonight. That helps us in, that helps us keep our live stream alive on Facebook Live. Shall so be sure to like, share, comment. All right, it's 7 p.m., so we're going to get started. So if you would, please bow your heads as we pray and ask God's blessing on our time together tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the gift of life, and thank you, Lord, for how you have kept us and preserved our lives. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to be able to gather together to meet around your word. I pray, God, that as we meet tonight, that your Holy Spirit, would speak to us, that he would lead us, give us divine revelation tonight as we uh, engage your word. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that uh, by your word tonight, you would meet each person who joins us right in the place where they need to be met tonight. Father, help us to be able to assess, to examine, to evaluate, uh, to look at with honesty, our life of discipleship. And Father, help us uh, to be able to make whatever necessary changes there are so that we might more effectively uh, not just follow you, but serve you and serve mankind. Uh, we're grateful that you would uh, choose to use us. Uh, we know that your word says that, that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Mm -hmm. And Father, we want to be used of your power uh, tonight and throughout our lives. And so, Father, we avail ourselves to what your will is for us, even as we um, look at this lesson tonight. I thank you for what you're going to do in our lives because of this lesson. I thank you for what you're going to do in the life of our church because of this lesson. Father, we commit our time to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So good evening to all of you who are with us, and thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Please be sure there are 14, 15 of you now on uh, Facebook Live. Please be sure to like, share, and comment tonight. Like, share, and comment that helps establish our algorithm, uh, and um, it uh, it helps to to boost um, what we're doing. Uh, it widens our footprint um, on social media, and uh, we need that tonight. So, uh, and uh, furthermore, um, we're excited to be back online. We're up and running tonight, uh, and uh, I am I'm extremely grateful. Uh, for that. All right. So having said that, we're going to dive into our lesson tonight. We continue. Uh, we actually just started this lesson, this series of lessons. Let's assess it. Uh, and that's where we are tonight. Uh, but before we, excuse me, before we dive into our lesson, there may be some new folk with us tonight. At least that's my prayer that we have some folk who are with us tonight for the first time uh, so that you'll have a feel for how we break out our lesson. Uh, we share our lesson in three segments, discussion, discovery, and direction. Our discussion section is usually a recap or an icebreaker to get us thinking around our subject matter. Our discovery section is where we engage the word of God to see what the Bible has to say about our subject matter. And our direction section is a take-home piece, something for our own consideration, 
uh, perhaps an action plan to put in place uh, to implement, to do something with the word that we study tonight. So discussion, discovery, direction, that's how we break out our lesson pretty much every week. Tonight, you will see uh, some slides that say, talk to me. This is your opportunity to, in, to engage us in live and direct conversation. To those of you who are with us on Zoom, of course, in those, uh, when that talk to me comes up, that's your opportunity to unmute uh, and, uh, and talk uh, directly to us and to our classroom. Uh, and to those of you who are with us on Facebook Live, please, when that talk to me slide comes up, make sure that you put those comments in the comment box and we will do our best to uh, read and acknowledge each one of those comments related to our talk to me uh, slide. All right. And then finally, uh, we do have a syllabus for tonight's lesson. I see uh, Cleaser McCullough's gross is on. God bless you, my sister. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Please tell Bishop uh, that uh, uh, I owe him a phone call. And uh, I hope that uh, those miles he rode on yesterday uh, don't take him out of action. To, to... <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Let me get back to Bible study. Uh, you can access our syllabus tonight um, uh, if you go to our website, stlukebcva.org. Um, and click on the Let's Assess It tab. You will scroll down to the appropriate notes. In fact, for this session, there is only one. There, there should be only one entry in there tonight uh, for, uh, for our lesson tonight. Click on that, and that will give you our notes for this evening's lesson, all right? And having said all of that, uh, we are going to dive into our lesson tonight. All right, uh, Mike, can you go help um, Aunt Midgey get on to the connection? All right, and so tonight um, in our discussion, because we did not complete our lesson from last week, all right, we did not complete from last time. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that we discussed last time and then pick up right at verse number 20, uh, 27 in our lesson tonight. All right, so we're at St. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. St. Luke 14, 25 through 35. You can turn your Bibles there. And I just want to, uh, I want to share this with us tonight. There were a few questions for our consideration, a couple things that we wanted to think about uh, as we approach this lesson of assessing uh, spiritual discipleship, following Jesus. Let's talk about it, all right? How do I know, uh, how do I know that I'm progressing or growing as a Christ follower? How can I gauge if I'm fulfilling Christ's call and claim on my life? And then we say, how might a church determine whether their work is impactful and making a difference in the lives of its parishioners and in the community? And what we said was, we have to evaluate, we have to assess, we have to examine. If you remember, those are our three words from last time, Facebook Live, if you're tracking with me on those three words, somebody hit that heart button, let me know that you're tracking with me tonight. All right. We said that there were three words. We lifted up three words last time. We said uh, evaluate, assess, and examine. All right. And we said that in order to know how we're doing, we've got to be able, we got to have a mechanism in place for us to be able to evaluate, to examine, to assess what we are doing, all right? And by doing so, by doing so, we can better determine where changes should be made, and more importantly, what changes and when those changes should be implemented. Did y'all get that? Did y'all get that? In order to be able to best determine when, where, how, and what needs to happen as far as change, as shifting, 
and as it goes, we have to listen. We've got to be bold enough to evaluate, assess, and examine how, what, when we are doing. You got it? And so our launch pad for this particular lesson is going to be Luke 14, 25, actually through 35. I don't know why the guy who made this slide didn't change it, uh, but Luke 14, 25 through 35. Um, and in this passage, in this verse, in this group of verses, this, I gave y'all this word on Sunday, pericope, in this pericope, this series of verses, Christ's aim was not to gather appreciative crowds, but to make true disciples, all right? And this is one of the aims of, our, of this study, uh, that we as St. Luke Baptist Church become true disciples and better stewards of the ministry which God has entrusted to us. And so we will begin because we've got to get, listen, before we can make practical application, we need to understand what's actually happening in the text, in the biblical text, all right? Please do not make the mistake of reading a biblical text and then trying to immediately make some kind of biblical, uh, rather practical application with it without understanding what's going on in the text. And so that's what we're going to do tonight with this part of our study. We want to see what the Bible has to say is going on here in, uh, in Luke. Doc, I just shared it with you. Um, in Luke 14, 25 through 35. All right, so here we are in our discovery section, our discovery section. Y'all ready? Here are our verses, Luke 14, 25 through 35. Now, great crowds were traveling with him. So he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still afar off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciples. Oh, boy. Now, verse 34, salt is good, but if salt should lose its taste, how will it be made salty? It isn't fit for the soil or for the manure pile. They throw it out. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen. All right, that's St. Luke 14, 25 through 35. Y'all got it? All right, and so we um, we said that this section of verses can be subtitled "The Cost of Following Jesus." And our um, really relevant question, uh, as we began this section on last week, was: Did you know that there is a cost associated with following Jesus? And then we shared a series of, of verses uh, that supported that idea that there is a cost. There is a cost associated with following Jesus, all right? Um, you know, uh, I don't know, I don't know how many of you uh, may still sing this song in church, but there's a hymn, there's a great hymn, and I appreciate Sister LaPearl for playing this on Sunday after the message. Uh, it'll probably be appropriate every week as long as we're in this series, uh, but she played, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And there's a line in that. There's a, there's, a, there, there's a lyric in there that says, the world behind me, the cross before me. Wow. 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 There is a, listen, there's a cost. I need you to get this tonight. There's a cost associated with following 
Jesus. Y'all got it? There's a cause. And as a matter of fact, I'm really feeling that in my spirit right now. Somebody just type that right up there on uh, on Facebook Live. There is a cost. You need to get this. There is a cost associated with following Jesus. We live in a world that wants to take the suffering out of Christianity. But in order for us to identify with Christ, part of that identity is the identity of suffering. My, 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 my. Let me point you back to one more hymn. One more hymn on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of what? Suffering and shame. And that, listen, that is what we take upon us my goodness, when we make the choice to follow Jesus. Wow. Wow. And so Jesus says, he says, if anyone comes after me and does not hate his father and mother, his uh, wife and children, his sister and brother, even his own life, that word hate, that's a strong word, hate, isn't it? That's a strong word. And what we said was the word hate here is not applying a negative combative disdain. Rather, the word hate here is, is really emphasizing having a lesser love. In other words, th there was a word that we that we use uh, that we put in front of this. And I want to share that word. I'm trying to get right to it in these slides. Uh, where there's the word. The word we said, the word that we can attach to that verse is this. The word is priority priority. We must, as followers of Christ, listen, if you are going to be a disciple of Christ, then that relationship must take priority of your, for your life, in your life, through your life, over your life, priority. Um, I gave this illustration on Sunday. Um, you know, um, you, you might understand this, you might understand this as it relates to the um, relationship of marriage, all right? <coughs> Excuse me, marriage. You know, excuse me, marriage. Uh, there's a line in the marriage ceremony that says, and it comes right out of Genesis chapter two, around verse 24, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave, King James Version, unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Listen, that, that means that that relationship between husband and wife takes priority over the, the old familial relationship. And I, I gave y'all a word of encouragement. To all my married folks gave y'all a word of a cut, a, encouragement, and that is this. Tell your mama and your daddy, mind their business, because the because this marriage is the priority now. Oh, my. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. I just mean it in terms of priority. Did y'all get that? Did y'all get that? Priority, priority. And so um, what Jesus is saying here at verse number 26 is, if you're going to follow him, then the relationship must be prioritized, all right? Um, God said, excuse me, God said to, uh, to Israel when they were leaving Egypt, when they were there in the wilderness, what did he say to them? The very first commandment that he gave to them was, don't have any other gods before me. He knew where they were going, he knew the land that he had promised them was inhabited by people who served other gods. And so he knew when they got there, my, 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 that they would, ex watch this, they would experience life in a way that it would challenge them. It would challenge, watch this, how they interacted with the God that they knew who brought them through the wilderness. And what God said is, don't make any other God, don't give any other God priority above me. This is not just first, this is priority. Did y'all get it? You, you do realize, you do realize that there is a difference between first class mail and priority mail. 
Come on, let's talk here tonight. There is a difference. There's a difference between the two. There's a difference between first class and priority. All right. And so what God says is, don't just make me first, make me the priority. Whoever would come after me, whoever would come after me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, and even his own life cannot be my, make it a priority. Y'all got it? Somebody shout, make it a priority. All right. To accomplish the goal of becoming, we must prioritize our relationship with Christ. I must make discipleship my priority. Y'all got it tonight? I must make discipleship my priority. All right. Now, let, well, before I say that, because that's going to get me ahead of myself. We have verse 27. All right. We're at verse 27. We are at verse 27 tonight. Let me grab my Bible. Uh, we're in, uh, I got my CSB here. Um, and it's, it reads this way. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. All right. One more time. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You got it? Now, I don't, listen, I don't want you to make the mistake of trying to make these verses stand independently of one another. These verses have to go together. And so Jesus says in verse 26, Anyone who comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And then, and watch this, in the same breath, in the same thought, he says, whoever does not bear his own cross, all right, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. So first, the very first thing that he says here is, You've got to make this discipleship thing a priority, all right? Now, get this. This is language that, uh, that the people that Jesus was speaking to, they were familiar with, all right? They lived under the auspices of the Roman government, okay? And when the Roman Empire crucified a criminal or a captive, the victim was often forced to carry his cross part of the way to the crucifixion site. Case in point, we're going to celebrate, and by the way, it is Ash Wednesday, we're going to celebrate in just a few days the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we can celebrate the resurrection, we've got to get through the crucifixion. All right, y'all come on, talk to me here. We got to get through the crucifixion. And a part of what Jesus experienced happened because of what the Roman government did. They made the criminal, they made the guilty who were sentenced to die on a cross carry it part of the way. Now, here's what's interesting. They made Jesus carry his all the way. Now it listen, I just I want listen, let that sink in for a moment. Let that sink in for a moment. Because um, you know, we repeat so much um that you know that that part of Isaiah where it says he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities that the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we're healed that you know, listen get this get this get this that's good and we feel very romantic about those words but i need you to understand what's happening here the, listen when they made jesus carry his cross to uh you know up the via della rosa to uh golgotha's hill get this they, they intensify the torture. There's nothing romantic about this. 
He was not just made to carry his cross part of the way. And in fact, when you read the account, you will find that uh, Simon the Cyrene, an African, comes and tries to assist Jesus with the cross, and Jesus kind of waves him off. Now, you can't handle this one, bro. You may have a cross later on, but this here is mine. He had to carry his cross. Y'all got that? All right. I didn't mean to preach tonight. All right. So, <laughs> excuse me. Carrying his cross through the heart of the city was supposed to be an implied admission that the Roman Empire was correct in the sentence of death imposed on him and an admission that Rome was right and he was wrong. Wow. Y'all see that? Now, carrying your cross. Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross. Y'all got it? All right, we're building here. So when Jesus directed his followers to carry their cross and follow him, he was referring, get this, to a public display before others that Jesus was right. Wait, one more time. When Jesus told his followers, take up your cross and follow me, what he was saying was, this is going to be a public display before the world that I'm right. Now, I need y'all to get that because we're going somewhere with this. Here we go. This is our first talk to me tonight. Boy, Cleidra, I wish I wish uh, I wish I could bring you into this discussion tonight. Uh, you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to have Kim send you the um, send you the Zoom link so you could jump on here with her. Uh, here's our question tonight: Is it acceptable today to publicly proclaim that Jesus is right? Don't just jump in. Think about it for a moment. Think about it for a moment. Facebook, think about it for a moment. Is it acceptable today to publicly proclaim that Jesus is right? Now, don't get on your soapbox. I know somebody is already there. You can't even say the name Jesus. We're not talking about that. What I'm saying is, is it acceptable today to publicly proclaim that Jesus is right? Mm. 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 Y'all ready? <laughs> My wife said nope. <laughs> All right, y'all come on, talk to me tonight. Y'all jump in. Not everybody at once. Generally speaking, I would say yes. All right. Josh says, generally speaking, he would say yes. Now, Josh, uh, you, you're going to learn this about me. I'm not going to let you go with a yes. Talk to me. Expand that so. Considering that the vast majority of the world follows the Protestant Christian faith, I would say that uh, most people who are, I, I would I guess, theists would agree that Jesus was correct. Okay. All right. All right. So, so Josh says, uh, considering that um, you know, many people in the world, that wasn't the word he used, but uh, I'm paraphrasing, many people in the world uh, follow Christ or, you know, they are theist is the word that he used. Uh, they would, they would agree that Jesus is right. Okay. I like it. Anybody else? There's going to be disciples who have to believe that Jesus is right. Is right. Uh, the scripture says, go ye into the world. Okay. All right. Uh, how can we teach if we don't believe that Jesus is right? Okay, good. I like that. All right. But the question is not, do we believe that he's right? The question is, is it acceptable today to proclaim that Jesus is right? Did y'all get that? Did you get it? Jesus There's others looking at us as Christians to be on the corner, to be in the community, to preach Christ, to, to believe, to stand for Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, and depending on their belief versus our belief, because we got we to gotta stand on the word of God. Mm -hmm. And the only way that they're going to be able to believe or know that Jesus is right is through the word of God that he speaks to us. Okay. All right. Good. Go ahead, Mr. Pearl. I would say it depends on who your public is. That's what I was going to say. Okay. Um, you know, if your public is 
um, um, good church going Christians, <laughs> you can proclaim that, that Jesus is right and uh, the vast majority will accept that Jesus is right. Okay. Um, if you're standing out there um, in um, the public marketplace and you proclaim that Jesus is right, you're probably going to get some throwback from that. Okay. All right. So, so you're saying say, context is everything. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. To your public. Okay. Because, I mean, if you're just shoving it down someone's throat, they might, you know, be less susceptible. You can get some pushback. Yeah. 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 But if, you know, ex explain, I guess, uh, why you believe in the best way possible. Yeah. You know, they might be more willing to accept. Good. Good. Very good. Please consider. Good. Good. Thank y'all. This is good, man. This is good. Let me see. I got some, I got some responses uh, on Facebook Live. All right. Please, this you're gonna look, listen. I, I'm I'm not gonna let you get away with just not acceptable. You're gonna have to give me some support. I appreciate that response. Uh, but but come on, unpack that a little bit for me. Let me see. Melanie says, absolutely. However, the way we live should proclaim or display that he is the way. Okay. All right. All right. This is good stuff. Anybody else? Anybody else before we move on? Anybody else? Not acceptable. I, you know, I, I vacillate, I, and I appreciate, Mr. Pearl. I appreciate your response because that's that's giving me some some perspective, giving giving me a little perspective. I tend to lean more on the side of not acceptable, but your response is challenging that in me. Thank you for that. Let me see. All right, uh, Cleja says you can lose your job if you work in corporate and wow, 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 wow. Come on, true. What she said is, you can lose your job if you work in corporate and proclaim Jesus. She is absolutely right. Wow. 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 She said, I agree with the lady who mentioned context. Absolutely. Mother Payne says, if we put him first in everything, then Jesus is right. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Listen, this was good. This was a robust discussion. I, I like that. Let's keep moving forward. All right. So look. Jesus says, once again, let me read that verse again. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You got it? The words that we can tie or attach to this thought are personal responsibility. If you have the syllabus, this is your second fill-in. Personal responsibility. One more time. Personal responsibility. So get it. You. I. Must prioritize the relationship get it the, these were actually my preaching points on sunday uh and i apologize for robbing you wednesday night folks of of uh of that first point prioritized relationship get it whoever comes after me and does not hate his father and mother wife and children, brothers and sisters, yea, and even his own life, prioritized relationship. Got it? All right. Now, the prioritization of the relationship is not anything that God will do for you. Don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this tonight. This is, this is really important. I need you to get this tonight. God is not in the business of doing for us what we can do for ourselves. Wait, one more time. One more time. I need you to get this. This is revelation for somebody tonight. Somebody who's on this call tonight is 
struggling with something and you've been waiting on God to do something and it seems like he has not moved. Well, can I tell you that it's not that he hasn't moved, he's waiting on you to move because he won't do for you that which you can do for yourself. Case in point, let's just talk about it for a minute. Remember when they were out on the Sea of Galilee and the guys in the boat said when they saw somebody walking across the water, they was like, man, that's a ghost. I know I haven't written that version yet. Man, that's a ghost. And Peter said, nah, that's Jesus. Y'all know, y'all know how Peter is, right? And so Peter was like, hey, hey, Lord. I know I haven't written that version yet. I don't mean to be disrespectful. But Peter was like, hey, Lord, if that's you, let me come out there where you are, right? He won't do for us what we can do for ourselves. And Jesus said, come. Which meant, <coughs> excuse me now, that Peter has the personal responsibility of stepping out of the boat. Now, when he takes personal responsibility and steps out of the boat, his eyes see stuff that they ain't never seen before because the Bible says when he saw the waves crashing and then it said when he saw the wind was boisterous. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen wind. But I'm just telling somebody that when you step out on what the word of God tells you to do, your eyes spiritually will see some things that you've missed in the past. Come on, somebody. But he took personal responsibility. He stepped out, watch this, but he got distracted. And the moment he lost his vision, he began to sink. But listen, he had the wherewithal to say, save me, Lord. Oh, by the way, that's personal responsibility. <laughs> because, listen, the text never said that Jesus just automatically reached down there and got him. He had to call out to him first. Come on, somebody. And perhaps maybe your deliverance, listen, you're missing your deliverance because you're not using your mouth. Say it out of your mouth. My God. Man, I don't know why we going this way tonight. But say it out of your mouth. Take responsibility for it. Save me, Lord. You got it? Save me. And when he says, save me, the Bible says that Jesus reached down, picked him up, and the very next verse says, and when they got back in the boat. Now, get this, get this, get this. We don't know what happened between them two verses for them to get back to the boat, but I believe that that's when the walking on water happened. But it didn't happen. Get this. Oh, my God. Get this. It didn't happen for Peter until he took responsibility for his own request. If it's you, tell me to come where you are. Jesus said, come. All right, I'm jumping out. Listen, this discipleship thing requires my personal engagement. Get it tonight. Because what, what has happened in the life of the church is that we have become vicarious livers. We want to live our discipleship through the pastor, or we want to live our discipleship through the ministry that we serve in, or we want to live our discipleship through somebody else. We want to live our discipleship on somebody else's faith. Listen, you can't, listen, listen, when you stand before God, you will not be able to ride nobody coattail. You're going to have to stand on your own. Come on, somebody. And so if you are going to be a disciple, a lifelong learner, then you got to take personal responsibility for it. Are y'all getting this? I, I, listen, listen, I love 
the testimonies. Come on here, Charles Spencer. The Lord doesn't want us to be cow's potatoes. He wants us to get up and move. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Get this tonight. Get this. I Listen, I love and appreciate all of the testimonies about, you know, the old church and, you know, the old church mothers and the old church fathers. And I love, I love to hear those, uh, you know, those historical um, um you know, accounts. I, I love to hear those stories. I love those testimonies. But get this, you got to listen, you got to learn how to love God for yourself. You got to learn how to study the word of God for yourself. You, you can't live on their faith. You, you got to, you got to find that for yourself. Jesus says, whoever comes after me, and listen, listen, and does not carry his own cross, cannot be my personal, my God, responsibility. Now, 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 now. The challenge is will I? accept the responsibility. It's, it's that simple. It's that simple. It, I can Listen, I can scream and shout and holler and spit and hoop and do all of that kind of stuff. I can do all of that and you can hear me. You can experience all of that. You can go away from this lesson tonight and go, man, Lord have mercy. I pastor was on one tonight. Man, the Lord really showed up in that lesson. And you listen, you can walk away and still not take responsibility for your life of discipleship. That's how I wait for him to read something next week. Help me. Help me. The question is, Will I accept responsibility for my life of discipleship? There's no need in you carrying the title of deacon. Wait, let me back up. There's no need in you carrying the title of pastor. There's no need in you carrying the title of uh, you know, of bishop or apostle. There's no need in you carrying the title of deacon or deaconess or trustee or choir member or usher. There's no need in you carrying the title of church member if you're not going to accept responsibility for what God has given us spiritually. If you don't take up your cross, you cannot be his I didn't say it. Jesus said it. The words that we attach to verse 27 are personal responsibility. Okay, let me get off of that. Well, at least off of this slide. Let's move. Let's move forward. Get this. Get this, bearing one's cross is a volitional act, volitional. That's a big word, right? Volition, volition, big word, volition, big word. Simply means that I choose to do it. All right, you got it? Volition, it just means that I chose to do this. I do it willingly. I do it freely. I do it without coercion. Bearing one's cross is a volitional act. I choose. I choose to bear, to bear my cross. I do it willingly, I do it freely, I do it without coercion. Um, some of you, uh, some of you know 
um, that the that the work that I do in terms of in terms of the social work that I do um, at, you know, as an occupation outside of church um, has me in court sometimes, right? And uh, there are spaces there are spaces in my in in the court interaction when an attorney is preparing to lead the person that they represent in what's called a colloquy, all right? And a colloquy is just them responding to a series of questions, all right? Before the inquiry begins, or as a part of the preparation for the colloquy, one of the questions that is asked prior to it is, has anyone uh, forced you or coerced you to make these statements that you're getting ready to make? All right. All right. And they do that in what's called open court to verify publicly that they are doing this of their own free will and their own accord. Y'all got it? The Bible says, my God, my God, that when, get this, when we get baptized, we do it of our own, get this, of our own accord. We're saying to the world by baptism that I identify, my God, with the Lord Jesus the Christ. Are y'all getting this tonight? It's an act of my will. It's not, nobody made me do this. Nobody coerced me to do this. Nobody held a gun to my head and said, you better get baptized right now. None of that happened. I do it of my own free will. I'm just trying to put some skin on it so you get it. When you, watch this, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is something that you do willingly, freely, and without coercion. Did you get it? It's a, it's a volitional act. All right. Now, many religious leaders in Jesus' day refused to do this. You'll see as you read through, and we, of course, we're reading through the book of Matthew. You ought to be on uh, chapter 22 today. Listen, uh, many religious leaders, you will find these kinds of interactions all throughout the Gospels. Whenever Jesus encountered particularly the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, they wanted to be religious on the outside, but Jesus said, you need to follow me inwardly, and they was like, we're not having no part of it. Come on, help me somebody. Now that, listen, that, listen, that was in Jesus' day. Many religious leaders in Jesus' day did not choose. They would, no, we refuse. We reject that. We, nah, we reject following him, right? Well, guess what? Sadder yet, many so-called Christ followers today continue to refuse to do this. What I need, what I need to be in Bible study for? Wait, aren't you a deacon? What, what I need to be in Bible study? Aren't you a preacher? What do I need to be in Bible study for? Don't you lead worship? What do I need to be in Bible study for? Don't you come to church every week? Help me, somebody. God is calling us, man, to a different standard. We're not just doing church for the sake of doing church. If you want to do that, you know, go hang out in the park on Sunday. You know, you know, the birds will enjoy your singing. Help me. But listen, Christ, listen, Christ is calling us to a certain standard. And we must uphold. I know, I mean, you know, you know, I know your grandma used to say we got to hold up the bloodstained banner. We got to hold it up until we die. But listen, most of us have let the banner fall. All right, Pope, move on. All right. So look, assuming personal responsibility for a prioritized lifestyle of discipleship, get this, is not easy. It's not easy. 
it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Don't let the world fool you into thinking that it's easy to be a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, the easy part is coming to salvation. Please don't miss this. The easy part is coming to salvation because that work has already been done. Jesus died once for all sin. His death, his blood covers all sin. And to receive that and to enter into salvation is easy. However, salvation is not the end of the life of discipleship. It's only the beginning. And assuming personal responsibility for a prioritized discipleship is work. It's work. It is not the most desirable position. Neither is it glamorous or publicly popular. Listen, when you make the decision publicly to say that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can expect challenges to come your way. Not the regular life challenge, because there are regular life challenges. And oftentimes we try to say, because of the regular life challenges that we face, that that's, that's bearing our cross. Actually, nah, it's not. Bearing your cross really has to do, watch this, it really has to do with identifying with the suffering and the shame that's connected to being a follower of Christ. Y'all yeah. don't want to hear that. I know you don't want to hear that. But that's the truth, man. It's not glamorous. It's not popular publicly. But when following Jesus becomes your priority, God promises a life of blessing despite challenge, despite trouble, and despite hardship. Y'all got it? I need you to get it tonight, man. I need you to get it. Listen, Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you will receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. Y'all got it? Yeah. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, my. We're pulling into the station, I promise. But before we go, <laughs> I got one more. I got one more talk to me tonight. I need y'all, man. Cleja, I really need you and Bishop on here tonight. Uh, what does bearing my cross look like in 2023? What does bearing my cross look like in 2023? Listen, I need, I need you to get this. I'm not talking about your addiction to cigarettes and alcohol. That ain't bearing your cross. Although that is a matter of personal responsibility. But that's not cross bearing. So, you know, before, before we get to that, you know, you know, that guy or that lady that you live with, that's not your husband or your wife. That's not bearing your cross. Ooh. 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 Cleidra, Cleidra on Facebook Live says isolation, loneliness, heartache. Ooh. 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 What does bearing my cross look like in 2023? Y'all come on. Y'all scared to answer tonight. 
<laughs> well, okay. I would say, well, but this is just sometimes, but with Pearl Smith's opinion. Okay. Say it's, it's showing the love of Jesus Christ to people no matter what. Um, it, it, you know, I mean, it just that showing the love of Jesus Christ to that homosexual or that um person that racist or, or um you know um that person uh you know that is you know spitting out hatred or whatever um it, and i'm not saying that you are accepting that behavior yeah but you're showing people the love of jesus christ because that's what jesus did um and that woman was caught that was caught in adultery yeah, he showed her love, and he did say, "Go and sin no more." Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, um, that he nevertheless demonstrated, you know, love and forgiveness. Yeah. So good, good. Let me, let me, because I, I, I was hoping that it picked it up. I don't, I don't know if it picked it up. Um, so Ms. LaPearl says tonight that it looks like uh, sharing the love of Jesus with people that that we come in contact with, and then, and then she. And then she kind of expanded it and said, you know, um, sharing the love of Jesus with perhaps a homosexual or or with a racist. Oh, my God. You know, somebody that, you know, that does evil to us. Go back and read Matthew chapter five in the Beatitudes. Yeah. Was, was that a good paraphrase? Thank you. OK. All right. All right. Good. 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 Anybody else? What does bearing my cross look like in 2023? What does it look like? This, this is good stuff. Let me see. Uh, Mother Payne says sadness. Melanie Jackson says bold faith. What does bearing my cross look like in 2023? All right, I'll give you 30 more seconds for somebody to jump in here. I would say it's a reaching your full potential as a Christian, not remaining a stagnant. All right. Resting in your laurels. I mean, you could go about that in many different ways. I think it depends on the, the person and what they want to achieve. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Good. Good. Josh says um, it looks like. Um, Say that one more time. Um, reaching your full potential. Thank you. Reaching your full potential in Christ. Doing all that he has called and created you to do. Becoming all that God has called and created you to become. Or, well, I, sh I shouldn't, say, shouldn't say reaching because, I mean, that could be a years long or lifelong journey. Absolutely. And it, and it absolutely is a lifelong journey. Right. It absolutely is a lifelong journey. This is, you know, this is this is one of those things where we where we literally, Josh, we grow uh, from one stage to the next. And, and, and for us, ultimately, the finishing point is when we get to heaven. When we literally get to heaven, that's the finishing point. Until then, we're always in, we're always in the process of, and this is the word that I really like to use, becoming. Right. Right. We're always in the process of becoming, always, always, always. Um, you know, this is this is not a word that's really connected um, much to um, theological thought or biblical teaching, mm -hmm. but a great it's it's a great word because of what it really means. That word is evolution. We're always evolving. We're always becoming. One stage to the next, one stage to the next, mm -hmm. one stage to the next, always growing, always moving. All right. So look, let's 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 hit it here. Uh daily identification with Christ in shame, suffering, and surrender to God's will. What does bearing my cross look like in 2023? Daily identifying with Christ in shame, suffering, and surrender to God's will. I, I want you to get that. 
daily identify with Christ in shame, suffering, and surrender to God's will. Oftentimes we hear people talking about receiving the blessings of God, right? We want the benefits of being in relationship with Christ. But the fact is, we don't really get to experience those benefits until we participate in the shame and the suffering. Mm. Mm. All right, I got I to gotta move because my time is up. It means death to self, to our own plans and ambitions, and a willingness to serve him as he directs. All right, John, 20, uh, John 12, 23 to 28. Jesus replied to them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life, I'm sorry, the one who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, the next one. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant also will be. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Y'all got it? Here we go. Last thought for the night. A cross is something we willingly accept from God as part of his will for our lives. A cross is something we willingly accept from God as part of his will for our lives. A couple years ago, um, uh, Ricky Dillard and New G recorded an album, and uh, I don't remember the name. I don't remember the title of the project. Um, all I know is one of my favorite songs off of that album simply said, God's will is what I want for my life. God's will is what I want for my life. And there aren't too many more words in the song. There's, a, there's another verse. Um, and then the hook of the song simply says, God's will is what I want. God's will is what I want. God's will is what I want for my life. Is that your desire tonight? God's will is what I want. God's will is what I want. God's will is what I want for my life. Whoever does not take up his cross, hmm cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. God, I know, I know that there's pain connected to my cross. I know that there's shame connected to my cross. Mm -hmm. I know that there's suffering connected to my cross, but there's surrender connected to my cross. And in doing so, I know that if I carry my cross, on Friday, yeah. I know that Sunday is coming. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right, I got a quick couple of time is up. Next week, uh, we continue in this 
in this uh, lesson, let's assess it. We're still assessing discipleship. We will pick up at verse 28 on next week. All right, verse 28. So Luke 14, 25 through 35, we'll pick up on verse 28 next week. I do have a direction for us tonight. Listen, what tools do you use to evaluate, assess, examine your level of commitment to Christ? What tools do you use to evaluate, assess, examine your level of commitment to Christ? Um, I would love to get your responses to that question. You can submit those responses to leadpastorslbc at gmail.com. And of course, um, with your permission, uh, we'll share your responses. We won't put your name on it. All right. So you don't have to. I mean, if you're embarrassed about it or something like that, you know, we won't put your name on it. We'll just, you know, we'll just put it in as a response. Uh, but uh, if you're bold enough, please send a response to my email by Tuesday evening uh, of next week. All right. Before we go, of course, we have two biblical affirmations. Our first affirmation comes from Ephesians 2 and 10 that says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. And our affirmation with that verse is this, that I am created with a purpose, for a purpose, on purpose. And then our second affirmation comes from Luke 17, 21. The kingdom of God is within me. Now, listen, you can't make this affirmation if you're not taking up your cross and following Jesus. All right. Listen, God bless you tonight. I don't have a very special announcement tonight. We've already we've already done our Black History celebration. And by the way, it was tremendous. We had a great time in fellowship watching the movie Emmanuel and then uh, having a very um, a very um, serious discussion following. It was fantastic. But listen, thank you for joining us tonight. Our benediction to you tonight is this. I commend you to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or imagine according to the power that is at work in you. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, world without end. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time right here on On the Move to Discipleship with St. Luke Baptist Church, Berryville, Virginia. We love you. We'll see you next time.